Advertising. You can't live with it, you can't live without it. Unless you paid $12 a month for an ad-free subscription, in which case, yeah, you can probably live without it. Since the dawn of advertising, companies have had one barrier stopping them from complete control over a person's mind. What if they just don't pay attention? Luckily for advertisers, but unluckily for your wavering sanity in this consumerist hellscape, your ears have a harder time ignoring things than your eyes do. As our knowledge of human psychology develops, advertisers use this information to figure out new ways to pry inside the human mind, plant the idea that you really feel like a bucket of fried chicken, and then leave without you ever knowing that they were there in the first place. Music and sound serve as the three most important tenets in advertising, being emotion, association, and suggestion. But how do they do this? Well, let's find out. Advertising used to be simple. It used to be all like, hey, we got this drink, it tastes good. But in the late 1920s, the depression was so great that advertisers found they couldn't just appeal to the rational consumer mind anymore. The landscape of American capitalism was changing. President Herbert Hoover made an effort to outline the importance of having a population that consumes. The following decades mark a slow and arduous transitional period for advertising. Ads shifted from being a pitch about the ways in which a product won't give you but probably will but might not give you diabetes to an experience, something that lingers in your mind whether you knew it or not, something that triggers a deep emotional response. Man, if only we had a universal tool that's pretty much an instant gateway into the emotional centers of the human brain. Oh wait, we do, and it's called music. You've probably heard of it. By this point, it was no secret. Psychologists had been studying for decades trying to figure out music and its effect on human emotions and decision making. So advertisers, being the remora of fish that they are, gained as much benefit from these developments as possible. From this, more advertisers began to see untapped potential in using music and sound to market their products. Let's fast forward a few decades, and nearing the end of the century, advertisers had this down pat. Marketing firms sought help of music libraries that curated music based on its mood. Tables like this helped in categorizing music for advertisers who didn't really understand music theory. I mean, it makes sense. You can't expect a marketing major to walk into your firm saying, I need a track written in 4 4 with a 2 5 1 chord progression with the bass jumping between the root and the fifth, evoking boss and over undertones, all the while the melody is played vertically over each chord, alternating slightly from my own into Mixolydian tonalities on the fifth and root, respectively, with a melodic bebop swing on the minor second chord. Dude, that made literally no sense. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, I guess I just need a uh, playful song, throw in a bit of a summery mood, uh, oh, and a dash of sexual. Case study time. Bonjour Jeans, a clothing company that mainly sold, well, jeans, obviously. In the early 80s, they were undergoing a bit of a branding transition. They wanted to abandon their previously workwear-centric identity and adopt a newer, sexier image. The advertising mogul in charge of their rebrand, Bill Backer, stated, Blue jeans should be fun to wear. So a commercial for blue jeans should be fun to watch. It makes sense. Around this time, they were running this ad. She's into bonjour action jeans with a sleek, elegant body style. She loves the way bonjour hugs the corners and handles the curve. Built to move. And built to look like they're moving even when idle. Bonjour action jeans. I mean, it's fine, but if you ask me, there's too many words. This isn't the old days of radio anymore. You don't need to explain to a consumer why the product is good. You gotta make them feel something. So they changed it. But the main difference being they added this absolute banger of a song. Advertisers noticed the effect that changes like this were having on consumer behavior. Adding a hot and sizzling track like this stops your ad from being a boring lecture about how hernia-inducingly tight your jeans are and turns it into a work of art, something that people want to experience for themselves. It wasn't always a hit though. There were some, shall we say, uh, experimental attempts at the further Frenchification of their product. Well, let's just say it sounds like this guy's about to make a mess in his new pair of bonjours, if you know what I mean. Bonjour. 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 But believe it or not, music wasn't just limited to sex appeal. In this now iconic Coca-Cola ad from the 70s, the ad features a group of ethnically diverse young adults singing on a hilltop. The message of this song? World peace. I like to teach the world to sing, sing with me. That's right. Coke really used a music number to sow into the minds of their consumers that their brand was synonymous with the idea of world peace. It was them saying to the youth, hey, 
We know you're scared about the fact that nuclear war with the world's competing superpower is not only possible but likely. We know what can stop it. Just offer the Ruskies a cold can of America's finest. Boom, pow, world peace achieved. You want world peace, don't you? Then well, you should buy a Coke. Now, obviously, this would be a ridiculous statement to make out loud, but in the same way that companies today like to pander to concerns about climate change while doing absolutely nothing about it, back in the early 70s, the equivalent was an anti-war sentiment, largely held by young, college-age demographics. Coke realized that the most effective way to get that message across was with an uplifting, inspiring music number, a tactic which Coke and other companies still implore to this day. I mean, I should think I don't need to explain it further. Music can affect your emotions. Yeah, groundbreaking stuff only on this channel. Studies in human psychology have shown that music has an incredible ability to embed memories and ideas into the subconscious. Advertisers know how to abuse this for all it's worth, in large part because the subconscious is responsible for most of the decisions you make, and by extension, most of the pointless stuff you buy. You may think that because you didn't consciously pay attention to an advertisement, that means you avoided its message entirely. This is far from true, and it's a difference between implicit and explicit memory. I didn't study psychology, so if I'm wrong, please go easy on me. Explicit memory is information that you're deliberately trying to retain. For example, when you're studying or when you're meeting someone for the first time. Implicit memory is the information that your mind retains without you knowing it. It's the reason why every time you ride a bike, you don't need to draw upon your notes on how to avoid stacking it. It's the reason why when you're at a house party and some hero picks up an acoustic guitar, everyone suddenly knows all the words to Wonderwall despite never searching through the Lyric Genius page. You sort of just subconsciously learn stuff over time. And that's the reason why when you hear a little it makes you think of this, 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 and this. One of the biggest advancements that advertising made was when the industry changed its approach from targeting your explicit memory, the conscious, to targeting your implicit memory, the subconscious. They realized that it just wasn't effective to explain a product in hopes that the viewer is actively paying attention. Instead, they needed to get through to the viewer on a subconscious level, which was quickly paired with the realization that you can shut your eyes, but you can't shut your ears. Enter the jingle. The jingle dates back to ancient times where merchants would wander the streets singing tunes about how they were selling bread or sheep or slaves. But in the recent century, having a catchy jam to burrow into the ears of your listeners was a great way to build brand familiarity. The jingle can range from a simple melody to accompany a slogan to a full track. Jingles prey on the hope that they get stuck in your ear. It's a sequence of notes that a brand wants to have ringing in your brain until you just can't take it anymore and you go buy a Toyota. If you're making a jingle for a product, you have two options. Make a song that is genuinely, you know, listenable, or make something so egregiously annoying that consumers will flock to your product just to make the pain stop. Wherever they're so strong, they're a moose. Nope, nope. Than scrubbing bubbles. Better than scrubbing bubbles. Bam. As a result, it's commonplace for advertisers to enlist the help of established singer-songwriters to write music that people might actually enjoy. Case study time. Quick disclaimer, it feels pretty wrong giving props to a company that has a controversies page that's dirtier than the water they leave behind in third world countries. You can't keep getting away with it! You can't keep getting away with it! But, in the 90s, Nestle, or more specifically Nescafe, hired electronic avant-garde artist Laurie Anderson to write a tune for their new ad campaign. And look, just quietly, this song is sick. Open your eyes, open your mind, open your thoughts. Don't stay behind. Open Let's up, open up. Open up, open up. Open up, open up. I mean, come on, okay, the lyrics mean nothing, but the synthesizers are dope and the melody is catchy without being annoying. It's a pretty well-made tune and it's a good example of how you don't need any annoying gimmicks to make a song work in an ad. If it's just good enough, people will remember it. But what actually makes a jingle good? Well, if you ask me, nothing, most of them are pretty annoying. But if I was pretending to be a marketing professor, I'd say it comes down to two things, repetition and adaptability. Repetition is important. I say if you're gonna make a jingle, go all the way with it. Have that thing in every advertisement possible. Bombard the masses with it on radio, on TV, on really average YouTube videos. That way it's being constantly fed into the ears of consumers. And that's where the second most important part comes in. It needs to be adaptable. 
The McDonald's jingle, for example, does this pretty well. Obviously, they have thousands of different ads for their range of life-shortening products, and the theme of each of these ads changes between marketing campaigns. So, if you want the jingle to fit each of these themes, it must be able to adapt. Here's some examples of how they kept the same melody but adapted it between different themes. Jingles ruled the advertising industry from the 60s until the 90s, but as ads got shorter in the new millennium, the viability of the jingle suffered a bit. They're still really common, don't get me wrong. But the advertising industry is one that's constantly trying to outrun itself. As soon as an advertising tactic becomes too commonplace, it ceases to be as effective. Coming into the 2000s, this was a major criticism of the jingle as a whole. It had become stale and predictable, and as advertisers learned in the latter half of the 20th century, advertising shouldn't feel like advertising, and as such, the jingle declined in popularity. In place of jingles, some companies have been drawing on already popular songs to help sell products. When you take a song that's already familiar to consumers, the song acts sort of as a conduit for any emotions that are already attached to it. They serve as a basis for personal meaning, and if you can advertise to someone on a personal level, they're way more likely to associate their identity with your product. This can be done in many ways. For example, using established music helps reach demographics that are already familiar with that music. Basically, you want to reach an old demographic? Put some rock music. You want to reach a young demographic? Put some rap music. It's not that hard. Around the late 90s, car brands like Volkswagen and Mitsubishi took this a step further. Volkswagen, for example, released an ad campaign in 1998 featuring a series of ads, all of which featured music from, at the time, relatively underground electronic artists. The director of marketing at Volkswagen at the time, Liz Van Zura, stated, We use very contemporary songs, but things we thought were cool. No matter the age, no matter what demographic you were, you'd think it's cool. There's the connection. You as a consumer recognize this cool music and subconsciously associate Volkswagen's brand with that idea. Mitsubishi were undergoing a similar change at the time. They had a younger demographic compared to most other car manufacturers. The idea from Mitsubishi around this era was summed up by the president of the company at the time. We realized that Generation Y would be reaching driving age soon. We knew if we were going to grow, we needed to reach them. We had this very simple idea. Let's make the Mitsubishi owners into a cool club. If they were all singing a Britney Spears song, the specialness of driving a Mitsubishi would have gone away. And so, they went with a song titled Start the Commotion by British techno band The Wise Guys. It's clever ways like this that brands use music with already established undertones to associate their product. It's pretty simple. Associate yourself with cool music and people will think you're cool. I mean, it's basically the same tactic that dudes on Tinder have been using for years. There have also been a number of ads that utilize the music of their celebrity ambassadors in more creative ways. For example, Michael Jackson was used in the mid 80s as a key ambassador for Pepsi. As part of his contract, this advert used an updated version of Billie Jean, where instead of singing about how he wishes to avoid paying child support, Jackson's lyrics were changed to being all about kids enjoying Pepsi. That Coke ad I mentioned before actually did this too. The original song being by a British pop group named The New Seekers, with the lyrics changed to be all about how Coke will single-handedly end all the wars forever. What these sorts of ads started though was an ongoing trend wherein artists would parody their own music in an ad, changing the lyrics to be about the product. Sound logos, what are they? Well shut your eyes and tell me what comes to your head when I play this. There's not much to it. You got a logo, well you need a sound to go along with it. It's a recognizable noise that, when you hear it, puts the image of the brand at the forefront of your mind. They aren't entirely dissimilar to jingles, but instead of being music, it's sort of more like a sound effect. There's ones that are a bit musical. Yeah, not bad, something to get stuck in your head. There's ones that represent an action associated with the product. And there's ones that sound like the literal gates of heaven opening up and blessing us with their divine life. Oh my god, take me. I mean, far out. The THX sound is maybe one of the most iconic sound logos ever. For them, it makes sense to go as hard as they did with this sound due to the fact that they're an audiovisual product. So, yeah, it checks out that their logo is loud enough to make your brain hemorrhage. 
Once again, it's all about using sound to force brand recognition. You want consumers who aren't even in the room to subconsciously hear a little and then book it to their nearest drive through for a fillet of fish. Suggestion is an important part of advertising. At the end of the day, every ad is trying to convince you to do something. Sometimes you even have a part of an ad that's distinctively telling the viewer to do something. In advertising, this is sometimes referred to as a call to action. It's when an ad features some kind of directive to the viewer, something telling them to go spend their hard-earned money on something they don't need. And music, believe it or not, can help persuade people into utilizing a call to action. You've probably seen this ad before. She's no shocker, however you like to top your whopper, you know what we'll say. Whilst being incredibly annoying, ads like this aren't really trying to do what the ads we looked at previously are. Whopper, whopper, build your whopper, barbecue They aren't trying to convey emotion, they aren't trying to forge association. It's just an annoyingly catchy song about how you should go to Burger King and build your own whopper. It's self-explanatory. It would have been boring if they just got up there and said to go build a burger and stuff so you just put it in a really annoying song and people remember it there's a pretty prominent trend in ads that just turn their information into music as a means of tricking the viewer into paying attention take for example this somewhat infamous ad for education connection I mean, who the hell thought this was possible? You're not even singing at this point. You're just awkwardly stringing words together over music. Why? I went on the internet and found education connection. Yeah, the song is annoying, sure, but that's kind of the point. It's just an annoying song explaining exactly what their product can do for you. You might think that in the case of ads, annoying is the same as boring, but this is far from the truth. Having an annoying ad that's memorable is way better than having a discreet ad that's forgettable. And hey, at the very least, if an ad is annoying enough, it might even become a meme, which is every modern marketing agency's dream as it means a whole lot of free publicity for none of the costs. A good example of this is that godforsaken Grubhub ad. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. This song got memed to the high heavens when it came out. So much so that someone like me, who doesn't even live in the country where this product is available, can't help but hear that god-awful flute at all hours of the night. Here's Johnny! Another common way that brands use music as a tool for suggestion is by sort of jingleifying their phone number. This is a smart way to get consumers to subconsciously remember your contact so that the next time they're in need of an aquatic mammal to wash their roof tiles, the first thing that comes to their mind is that little jingle. If I was still pretending to be a marketing professor for a moment, I'd argue this is the best form of using music for advertising. The music isn't trying to be anything special, it's just trying to be memorable. It's capitalising on the way that music has a unique ability to work its way into the mind without you knowing. There's countless studies about how music can help the brain memorise information, so it makes sense that advertisers were smart enough to package their details in with a catchy little jingle so you remember it without you knowing. Basically what I'm saying is that it's harmless, at least in comparison to this garbage. You could argue that all the ads I've shown in this video use music as a tool to suggest a call to action. And you'd be correct. Remember, these three pillars that I mentioned aren't mutually exclusive categories where advertisers have to choose which one their music will fall into. And more than anything, I just needed a cute way to structure this video. The best advertising music will uphold all three. A good piece of music in an ad will spark emotion in the viewer, it will carry undertones that associate the product with an idea or person, and it will ultimately suggest. It will suggest that you don't think twice and that you should start purchasing. So am I wrong in saying that advertisers use sound to hack your brain? Well, if you ask me, that's exactly what they're doing. They're directly capitalizing on the brain's substantial capability to connect with music on both a subconscious and conscious level. They work their way into your mind, against your will, without your knowledge. Is that a bad thing? Well, I'm not too sure. Just please, for the love of God, don't buy anything off of Grubhub. Well, thanks for watching. I actually did research for this one, so the links to the two main sources I used can be found below, along with a couple other useful things I found along the way. 
I'd love to keep talking to you, but my new pair of bonjours just came in the mail. And well, I gotta go wear them in. So, uh, okay, thanks, bye.